and I will go ahead and introduce our speakers for this evening. So I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Caroline Hamm, a medical oncologist at Windsor Regional Cancer Center. Dr. Hamm was a founding member of the Windsor Cancer Research Group and continues in her role as the clinical research director. She completed her Doctor of Medicine at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, her BSc at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, and her BED at Western University in London, Ontario. She's an Associate Clinical Professor, Department of Biomedical Sciences, University of Windsor, and an Associate Professor in the Department of Oncology, Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry, Windsor Campus. And I'd also like to introduce Debbie Sutton, who has worked at Windsor Regional Hospital since 1999. Debbie is a registered nurse and certified in oncology nursing since 2012. She's also an active member of the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario. Debbie graduated from St. Clair College of Applied Arts and Tech in 1996. She works at the Windsor Regional Cancer Clinic since 2007 and previously worked on the inpatient unit. So welcome Dr. Ham and Debbie. All right, so uh, today I'm just going to talk about the immunotherapies that we use in melanoma, and they asked if I could just do a little bit of talk as well on the uh, uveal melanoma and squ squamous cell skin cancer. Um, and so, um, so, uh, and I've tried to put both the generic name and the trade name because people always know these by different things. Everything in medicine has two names, um, so the trade name and the generic name. Um, the checkpoint inhibitors that are PDL1 inhibitors that I'm hoping you understand by the end of this are, are the Pembro and Nevo, also called K Truda and Updevo. Your boy has a different mechanism of action, CTLA4 monoclonal antibody, to Bentifus that um, is used for uveal melanoma. I'll talk a little bit about that, also called Kimtrak. And, and I'll talk a little bit about how it works. And then semiplumab, which is another checkpoint inhibitor, and we use that in squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so this is kind of the first thing that happens when we develop a cancer. And melanoma is one great example of a cancer that's really sensitive to our immune system. So if you start with, I don't know if people can see my cursor, but the tumor has an antigen and presents that antigen to this T cell, T cells and the antigen presented cells, that's all our immune system. And so the tumor will present the tumor, th their own antigen that says, this is me, I'm a tumor to the T cell. And that, that just, the T cell just says, oh, hello, nice to meet you. And it develops a receptor to that. The, um, what happens next is that the, then this is the tumor that presents the antigen will develop some blockages, a way to block the tumor, block the immune system from going too crazy. And we do that really to protect ourselves. It's a normal protection for the body not to have their immune system go out of control. Otherwise we would all be walking around with all of the many side effects that we see with this immune therapy. Um, and we'll talk about them after, but we need to keep it under, under the immune system under control so that, uh, that our immune system doesn't fight ourselves. You need to remember your tumor is actually part of you and it has you all over it. And so you, you don't want your immune system fighting you. You would love it just to fight the tumor, but it, that's a part of the problem is that when we let the, our immune system fight the tumor, we're letting it fight us as well because the tumor grew in us and it has markers of us on it. So two of the breaks that, we, that, the, that our bodies use to keep our immune system in check is one called CTLA-4, and you might not remember, but that's what ipilimumab blocks. And then the second break we put on our immune system is PD-1, program cell death one. And it keeps these immune systems, which is called our cytotoxic T cell, that means a killing T cell. It keeps this killing T cell from killing the tumor, but also from killing us. And so that those are really important, uh, those really important breaks to have on our immune system. So what the, this, to, this drug was the first one to be identified called, uh, there was tremolimumab and there, we actually had a study going on before that, uh, tisalimumab, they, and now ipilimumab, which has kind of been identified as the best of the group. It gets, it gets into that, that break, the CTLA-4 break, 
and blocks the connection between the break and that, that presenting cell and allows this, this T cell to go in and actually kill that cell. And so this break has been allowed, allows that T cell to, to move on and do, some, do its killing. The second break that we have is this PDL1 on the tumor cell and the PD1 on the T on the immune cell. And when they're matched together, there's this turns off the T cells as it can't do any work. But what we do with our PDL1 blockers and PD1 blockers is we take that break off and then the gas can go on. So it just allows the, the T cell to move in and kill those tumors, but it also allows it, it the, that immune system, this T cell, to go in and kill everything that looks like us, which includes all of the side effects, like your joints and your rash, your skin and your liver. And we'll talk about that, but that's the side effects of it is we've allowed our immune system grow up, start killing the tumor cell, but we, that tumor cell is also ourselves. And so it's gonna be doing some of that as well. So that's what we have to learn how to control. That's the, the this is the delicate balance of treatment and no harm. So that's what we're here to talk about today. So ipilimumab, one of the first drugs out that we identified to unleash this immune system and fight melanoma, because melanoma is really sensitive to our immune system. In fact, we some people get a melanoma and it can go away on its own. And, you, and that has been documented. And then we, that's how we started thinking, wow, that's our immune system fighting the cancer. The problem is it's not strong enough to fight most melanomas and we need help. But when it came out back, and this is back in 2013, 22% of people at three years were still alive with cancer, which was remarkable for our patients with metastatic, which means stage four, where it's spread to different parts of the body. That was a remarkable um, outcome for people at that time. And, and so that was a great identification of a new drug. So then nivolumab, so the, the IPI, this one, this IPI we call for short, that one is the CTLA-4 blockers. That was the first break. And then what we did is we took the second break and found a, a, found a way to block that second break. And this nivolumab was, uh, was even better than, than the ipilimumab. And they've compared it here. And this is in, um, in uh, patients with a... a metastatic melanoma, the results are quite good, maybe a little better than we normally see with metastatic melanoma because of the group that they included in this group. Decarbazine is a chemotherapy that I still use in melanoma and I still have people with long responses, but it's not nearly as good as this nivolumab. So we found that, wow, this is super exciting. Nivolumab is a great drug we should look at. And so the one thing they were worried about, because this is the breaks I was talking about before, we can measure these breaks on the tumor. And if you don't have very many breaks, maybe the drug wouldn't work, but they have actually identified that it doesn't make that much difference whether you have those breaks or not. It's not, it's not a, a reliable marker to see if it's working. Maybe we're just not great at measuring the breaks. Who knows? This PDL1 and PD1. Uh, but anyway, it, it doesn't, it, even if you didn't have it on your tumor, you still would get a really good response and much better than if you just used regular chemo. And so, of course, we thought, well, if they're good drugs working on different breaks, what if we give them together? And could we do better if we give them together? And so this study published by Dr. Larkin in 2015 really did identify that as a that as the best outcome for people. So there's this Nevo plus Ipi. So the two blocking both breaks, there's the Nevo by itself blocking the one break. And then there's Ipi by itself blocking the CTLA-4 break. And so lots of discussion around this. And, and we we're going to talk a lot about the fact that the combination is a lot more toxic and in fact, I have had people that, that actually die from the side effects. So it's actually very, very important, especially in the earlier days when we're getting used to these drugs on how to handle them. This is uh, really important that you stay on top of what's going on with these drugs. We, this first study also said that it only worked in people that had that break on their tumor. 
is so without the break, it didn't work. But now we're learning that no matter what, it's better. So what this is, and we use this in oncology all the time, is something called a survival curve. So this is the percent of people alive without cancer. This is 100% of people. Every time the line goes down towards zero, someone's cancer has come back. And so you can see at three months is probably when the patients had their first CAT scan, a lot of people's cancer came back, especially in the IPI group, up to one half of them. So that's 50% of people, half of them had their cancer come back. And so, so you can see that there is lying down here, where if you go out to 18 months, you can see that about 20% of people are living without their cancer. But it's a much better number if you got both drugs together and it's, it's good, but not quite as good if you just had the one drug. And so you will find that your doctor will have a conversation with you as to whether or not you should get the one drug alone or both drugs together. And you will see the major difference between these two lines is a lot of side effects. And so you have to decide if you want a higher chance of doing better. And I'll have, I'll say we definitely see this people living a long time with these two drugs but but a lot more side effects. And you can also see here that the difference isn't a lot. So in this top line, the number is about, it ends up at about 45% of people without cancer. This is metastatic melanoma, people where the cancer has spread to their lungs, to their liver, to their brain, to their bones, 45% of them without cancer long-term. And this number here is a little bit lower, probably about 10% lower. But we'll talk about the benefits and the side effects. This is the five-year follow-up of that same study. So you can see here, this is people who are alive. 52% at five years alive with stage four melanoma on the combination arm. 44% alive with metastatic melanoma at five years with an nivolumab alone, and 26% with the ipilimumab alone. These curves are important to look at too, because this is people living without cancer. So 36% alive without cancer at five years on the combination arm, 29% on the single agent nivolumab, and 8% on the single agent ipilimumab. So the other thing is people with melanoma will know their BRAF status is important. This is just another marker, like what we saw those breaks were, another marker on the cancer. And it really didn't matter. The BRAF status doesn't matter in terms of are you going to respond to these drugs or not. Just a little, the little side, uh, side road we'll take here with semiplumab, which is exactly the same class of drugs called PD-1. So they're blocking that PD-1 um, break. And it's really quite remarkable, the squamous cell carcinoma, people that can respond. It's equally toxic as the nivolumab. Um, it has the same side effects as nivolumab. So you can just think of that the same when we talk about side effects. I actually find it maybe a little more toxic in my squamous cell carcinoma patients when I give this drug, but they are, um, but... Um, because they already have some skin issues, I think. But I recently had a lady that had like skin lesions all over that weren't controlled. And she got, I couldn't give her very much. I think she got two or three treatments, had bad diarrhea, and then she got better. And she got better. She has a little diarrhea, but tolerates it easily. And her skin lesions are in control. So pretty remarkable. The other thing I'm going to talk about is metastatic uveal melanoma. So this is actually melanoma in the eyeball. You can see that when you look at it, you see this weird black thing in the eye. And this has been in the past a very, very difficult um, melanoma to treat. And by using this brand new drug in a specific group of people, so you have to do this blood work first to find out Again, this is kind of weird, but you need another protein on your cancer for this one to work. And so if you have this protein in your in your cells, in your white cells, not on the cancer, in your white cells, then this drug will work. Especially, It's using the immune system as well to help fight the melanoma. I'm not going to go too much into the details. What they did find is they compared this new drug to Bentifus, 
to our standard treatments, the pembrolizumab, which is the, is the PD-1 blocker, ipilimumab, the CTLA-4 blocker, and a, and a regular chemo. And they compared the, the overall survival, again, 100% of people. Every little line in here, you can see them here, is a person. And every time there is a line, that person, the line goes down towards zero and someone passes away from their disease. This is progression-free survival, a more important curve to look at. And you can see that the tibentafus will does not work. It, this is 50% line here in about half the people. But then it starts working in some of the people and it works a little bit better than in the people that got the regular treatments. So what we're here really here to talk about is this toxicities of immune therapy. So I'll start with the tibentafus. Tibentafus, it, it has um, two main side effects. So one is cytokine mediated, the other is skin like rashes. The cytokine is fevers. Um, fevers is the big thing. Fevers, uh, low lightheadedness, uh, flu-like symptoms. The, and so that happens around the time of infusion and it usually happens in the first four infusions and then people just get used to it. But up almost a half of the people have more serious reactions, like, like ones that either make them go to the hospital or, or some, and so that's almost a, a half of them. Uh, and so that's really important to keep in mind, especially in the first four treatments, you can get quite sick early on. This is the so general side effects associated with the combination of Nevo and Ipi. And I just wanted to bring this up to really, it's a huge, you don't have to read the whole thing. They just talk about the common ones, which are skin, stomach, liver, hepatic means liver, thyroid, and lungs. But you can see here in patients that have a combination of both the Nevo and Ipi versus Nevo alone or Ipi alone, if you look at the more serious ones, the grade three to four, 40 uh, of the people had grade three to four. With Nevo alone, only eight. And Ipi is in the middle at 19% of people. So you can see that you're much more likely to run into trouble with serious side effects in the combination therapy. And we'll talk more about these. You don't have to memorize that chart. In terms of when it happens, this is ipilimumab, but they're very similar throughout. So this is weeks after treatment. So usually around the second treatment, you're going to start seeing rashes. And then the week after, maybe liver problems, diarrhea. And then uh, and then a little bit after, we're going to talk about this hypophysitis, which means kind of it's kind of a blood pressure problem that starts in the brain. And so you can see a lot of this stuff starts off early on. And that's more common what we see as an earlier onset of, of side effects. So ipilimumab by itself, these are all the same side effects we see with everything. Um, this is kind of a general management guide, which this is not for you guys to learn. But I just thought it, this is by itself, you can still see there's lots of problems with ipilimumab that it can cause problems. But you have to remember that's 55% of people will know have, have no problems. And I have those people as well that kind of sail through, get their treatment, go home, nothing happens. So this is a huge side effect slide that, that everybody's given. And it's a gigantic list of everything that can go wrong. This is the same kind of picture. The, they have a lot of big words on here too, like hepatitis and colitis and hypophysitis that we don't expect patients to understand. So what we thought we would try to do is just pull out early grade one and grade two side effects, because this is grade two is when you should be calling your family, your doctor and getting on some treatment and changing your treatments. So we thought we'd find grade two and tell people what grade two is and say, this is when you should be calling us. And so rather than that gigantic slide that I'll, I'll tell you, it's a little overwhelming for even uh, healthcare professionals. If we can simply really focus on when we should start looking, because we know that if you take care of them early, then we're going to, you're going to be in a better place. We'll be in a better place on managing that. Again, the most common skin problems like rash and itching, liver, which we'll measure in the blood, stomach, GI, bloating and diarrhea. And then this endocrine, which is a thyroid and pituitary thing, which uh, Debbie is going to go through these for you. 
And she's going to uh, be kind of walking through just the, the early stage, grade one and two, when grade two, you should be calling us. This is, the, in, this is an infographic we developed for patients and we're actually simple, simplifying. This is just grade two. This is when you should call us. And so we're happy to share this with anybody that wants it. We are gonna be simplifying it a little bit more even than this to try to really get the message across to patients is call us as soon as you have any of these. So we actually want you to know more than, than what's on this page and that's what we're here to do. So I'm gonna pass it over to Debbie, uh, who is a nurse extraordinaire. We've worked together for 25 years. We're definitely work married. And uh, she's um, a brilliant uh, person and nurse. So Debbie. Thank you. Well, I'm Debbie. I'm a nurse that works with Dr. Ham, um, like she said, for many, many years now. So uh, it's nice to be able to sit here and talk to other people um, dealing with melanoma. So one of the side effects that often people do experience with immunotherapy is skin rashes. So usually I tell people before they start any treatment to kind of examine their skin or have their spouse or significant other look at their skin, see what the normal looks like at baseline. And then if anything starts to develop when they start treatment, then they kind of had some guidelines. So grade one is a rash of less than 10% of your body. Maybe you notice a little bit on your chest, maybe your arms. Um, we don't really need to do anything at this time. We can use things like hydrocortisone cream, cool compresses, anything like that, um, moisturizing, a vino, anything with oatmeal, those sort of things. And if it's itchy, we can use things like Benadryl. So we just kind of start off with that. And then we make sure that um, everything is okay that way. If everything resolves, then we don't have to do anything. We can just continue. If it's grade two, where it's 10 to 30% of the body that's being affected, we would consider maybe seeing the dermatologist. Um, again, we would do things like topical steroids, maybe even consider a little bit of prednisone to see if that can help settle things down. Um, and then um, again, watch it, Benadryl, antihistamines. If symptoms continue to worsen, um, where there's blistering, um, rashes spreading everywhere, extremely itchy, red, raised, those sort of things. That's when they're calling us right away. And again, kind of to reinforce what Dr. Ham said before, we have to respect these treatments. And so catching things early on, um, can prevent any further treatment delays and even holding the drug if we had to. All right. So the next side effect that is fairly common is diarrhea. Um, so again, we need to know baseline, what your baseline bowel movement is. So if you have two bowel movements a day, anything that's four above that, then that's when we need to be concerned. Um, we don't need to do anything as far as GI goes. We don't need to start any steroids, but we can certainly start some uh, Imodium. Um, we can make sure that we're doing hydration, following a specific diet, avoiding spicy foods. Um, anything that's really processed can add to diarrhea. Staying away from dairy for a while might also help. Um, following a brat diet, bananas, rice, applesauce, toast, all the things that we used to do when we were kids for diarrhea, we can do that now. So, and then we just start monitoring. If modium works, great. Um, we can continue that as long as it's not exceeding anything further. So then with grade two, we need, if it's four to six above the norm, then we have to consider sending you to see a gastroenterologist. That's a, a gut doctor. They can do a scope just to make sure that everything's okay to take a look. Maybe there's another cause for it. Um, sometimes they even do stool samples to make sure, but um, right away, we're going to start steroids if there's no improvement with modium. And then we wait until it starts to get back down to a grade one. So if it was four stools a day and they were up to say eight and they went back down to four, that's great. Um, we're gonna continue watching them. Maybe we need some extra fluids or whatnot. We have done that where we send out for the visiting nurses to come out. Um, we can add prednisone if not any better with fluids. And then again, we're gonna hold the immunotherapy until grade one and then, um, steroids, of course, and we have to make sure that the steroid dose is down to a particular amount before restarting it. And then if there's no improvement within 12 weeks of having um, stopping everything, then we would consider stopping the immunotherapy altogether.
So hypothyroids. So those are the type of things that we're watching all the time with blood work. Um, before any treatment, we're always checking uh, for TSH to see what your thyroid function is doing. If you're not having any symptoms of anything or like fatigue, constipation, weight gain, appetite, those sort of things, then we have, then we'll just monitor and we'll let, look at your blood work. We don't have to add any steroids. We don't have to do any other supportive care. Um, but we will watch you closely. Um, if it's grade two where they're having symptoms and we notice that there's been changes in the thyroid function, then certainly we might need to start something like low thyroxine, which is just a pill that people take once a day. Um, sometimes we have to hold the treatment until there's an improvement in those levels as well. Um, but oftentimes people will say, I'm feeling great, except I'm so tired. And uh, that's one of our biggest things. And oftentimes when we look at the blood work, we'll see that there is a problem with the TSH and we have to do something about that. So it can go the other way where it's too low before, now it's too high. So again, we're looking at those thyroid functions. Um, we're just gonna monitor the blood work. We're not gonna really have to do anything per se. Um, but just watch. And of course, patients, we expect them to give us a call if they're having any symptoms. Like I said before, oh, I'm so tired. I can't figure it out. This way might be all of a sudden they're losing weight, more appetite, anxiety, those sort of things start to happen. Um, that's a reason to give us a call. So if they are, we'll look at the blood work. Sometimes we have to send to an endocrinologist. That's somebody that deals with hormones. Uh, we might have to consider a short course of steroids as well. Um, usually don't have uh, symptoms, but sometimes people might need a little bit of a, a beta blocker, which is something that helps control the heart rate. And then we're going to hold the immunotherapy if there is any um, symptoms that are not controlled, or we can't get down to a certain dose for the prednisone. So next, what we got to do, this is the thing where Dr. Ham was talking about before that can be pretty common. Um, Sometimes people don't have any symptoms, maybe a little fatigue, maybe a little weak. We're going to check their blood work. We're not going to give any steroids. Um, but the blood work that we might do is again, those thyroid functions, we might check your cortisol to see what's going on. Um, maybe if you're having some other issues, like we're going to check your vital signs. If we notice if there's any changes there where your heart rate is up and your blood pressure is down those sort of things, then we're going to pay a little bit more attention to you. Um, that's with grade two, we're going to start prednisone. And again, if there's not much improvement for things, we might have to add something like a hydrocortisone uh, supplement. Um, we might need to start level thyroxine. And again, we might have to hold until it's grade one. Um, so if you're grade two and having symptoms, we're going to hold that treatment until things improve again to a grade one. So next we have adrenal insufficiency. Um, these are all kind of related uh, to your hormones, the last three slides really. Um, so again, sometimes people with adrenal insufficiency will have that low blood pressure, really, really fatigued, really, really weak. Sometimes people have vomiting with it, headaches, um, nausea, all those sort of things can kind of happen. So, um, we're going to do that blood work, special blood work to make sure everything's okay. Your cortisol, your aldosterone, all these kind of things kind of um, lead us in the direction of, that this is a problem along with symptoms. If it's grade two, we might consider starting prednisone. Um, there's other things that we can use too, um, like it's uh, called Florinef. It's another drug that can kind of help boost up your blood pressure and help regulate the salt balance. And that's kind of the reason why you're having all of these symptoms. Uh, if somebody's going to be on hormone replacement, you should have a medical alert bracelet as well. Uh, if grade two and symptoms are not controlled um, to grade one, we may have to, um, we can resume after a taper of steroids. And oftentimes people feel fairly good once we've initiated steroids or even uh, Florinet for this. People usually feel better within a couple of days after starting these medications. Then we have our liver toxicities. Of course, with all of these 
side effects, we're kind of watching blood work and making sure. And oftentimes it's, uh, if I get the blood work first and I notice that there's a huge change in those lab values, I'm going to Dr. Hammond saying, oh, look at this, we need to do something. And then we're also calling them to make sure everything's okay. Um, we don't really have to do anything at first, but monitor those blood values and for patients to report any symptoms, of course. If it's grade two, we notice that there's some of those blood um, work changes where those liver enzymes are starting to creep up. We might consider sending you to a gastroenterologist again. If blood work is not improving in three days, then we're going to start prednisone again over, and it's a taper. So we're going to start off with a bigger dose and we're eventually going to decrease that dose over two to four weeks. Um, we do need to hold immunotherapy again until a grade one or less, or if prednisone is less than 10 milligrams a day. So the toxicity of the nerves, um, oftentimes it can be subtle. And uh, I, I, I think for myself, I don't know for Dr. Ham, but sometimes the weird, like when people start reporting unusual symptoms, I pay attention to it more with immunotherapy because it usually ends up being something related to it. And this recently happened with us too. So grade one, no um, major symptoms are very mild. So you might notice some twitching or um, weird muscle changes or some funny feelings in your feet. We don't have to do anything right away. We don't have to start steroids. There's not much we can do except monitor. But if we start to notice that there is some changes in blood work, um, oops, sorry, wrong slide. If we do notice the changes in blood work, we might need to send to, I'm sorry, let me back that up. We're not sending to GI for this. We're sending to neurology for this. We might need to do an MRI, nerve conduction studies from the neurologist, uh, spinal tap to rule out other causes. Um, so I'll tell you, one of our patients came in with a, a little droop in her eye, just ever so slightly. We noticed it, we held treatment, we decided to do some tests, MRI, and then the next time she came in, and it was probably about two weeks later, that droop was even more noticeable. So we do think that it was probably related to her immunotherapy, and we started her on steroids. So um, if there's no, we're going to taper that steroid over four weeks. If there's no improvement um, or gets worse, we might have to consider adding some other medications to help with that until grade one. And we can also consider other things like IVIG, which is a blood product, plasmapheresis, those sort of things can help control that too and help improve uh, the nerve damage. But if we continue with symptoms, we have to hold it until grade one or less or less than 10 uh, milligrams of prednisone a day. So lung toxicities can happen as well. So Again, knowing what your baseline is, um, grade one, there's no really any symptoms, but we've noticed something on a chest x-ray or a CAT scan that could be concerning. Um, we're going to monitor their oxygen levels. So we're always checking their oxygen saturation rates. We might order a CAT scan or a chest x-ray to rule out pneumonia. Um, we might consider steroids even at grade one, um, especially if they're having more shortness of breath. And then the immunotherapy we're going to hold if they are on steroids. Grade two, um, symptoms are, we might notice an uh, increase in cough, dry, unproductive cough. You might notice that you're more short of breath or having a hard time talking um, while breathing at the same time. You might notice that your heart rate's up. You might notice that your lips might be a little blue or even your fingertips might be a little bit blue. So we're going to start steroids. Um, taper. If no improvement in a couple of days, we're going to treat you like it's a grade three or four. We might have to consider holding immunotherapy. We might have to consider putting in the hospital to monitor as well, um, making sure that the lung function is improving, adding antibiotics, adding steroids. And again, we might have to hold it if it gets to that point where we're unable to um, correct it. So we're doing chest x-rays. If you do end up in the hospital, they're probably doing them every day and making sure that there's nothing else going on. Um, and of course, sometimes we have to um, consult respirology or infectious diseases if it is related to that. 
So our kidney toxicities, again, with blood work, grade one, we're going to look at that creatinine. That's part of the testing that we look at to see if your kidneys are functioning properly. Um, if everything is, you know, grade one, we don't need to really do anything. We don't need to add steroids. We do want to encourage lots of hydration. Two liters of water a day is important. So I tell people to break it down to four water bottles, two 500 mils in the morning and two in the evening, and you're all set. Um, maybe have to look at different other medications that might be adding to kidney issues. Um, we're going to continue looking at all the electrolytes with that and the creatinine. If it's grade two um, and it's above the baseline of what your normal kidney function is, we might consider sending you to a nephrologist, which is a kidney doctor. Um, we might do an ultrasound of the kidneys as well, just to see if there's anything else going on um, that way as well. We would consider starting steroids and taper over two to four weeks. We also would consider adding mycophenolate Mofetil. <laughs> I even have a hard time with the words too. So um, those are some of the drugs that can help with these sort of symptoms. We're going to monitor blood work every couple of days. Um, we're going to hold immunotherapy until the creatinine has improved to grade one, or if prednisone is less than 10. And then if anything worsens, we're going to treat it as a grade three, and we're going to stop these treatments. So grade three to four toxicities, those are when they're really serious. Um, with Nevo, it's happened 7.7% 7 .7 of the time. Ipi alone, we see it creep up a little bit more at 18.6%. But of course, when we combine them, like Dr. Ham said earlier, that's when the toxicities can be even worse. So that's why we super in stress right in the beginning. If anything is occurring that is out of your baseline or out of the ordinary, you definitely have to give us a call. And I even tell them, tell my patients like, you're not bothering me. It's okay. I don't mind answering these type of calls. Um, especially when they're first starting out, we just had somebody who did a big Nevo and I told him everything. So he called, I have a rash. Okay. We're going to do this. We're going to do Benadryl. We're going to do hydrocortisone. He called the next day and said, it is everywhere. So we brought him in and sure enough, we had to start him on steroids and he's at, and we saw him in a couple of weeks. He's actually improving again. So hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we can get him started again on some treatments. So for the grade three and four toxicities, um, I'm not going to go through those because I want to keep it simple and direct for when you guys should be looking for help. And so I, I think that's the important thing. If it's more serious than what Debbie described to you, then the doctor should be managing it. And basically it's it's where you just can't live your normal life. You need hospitalization. Those are really um, those are really important things. So we want you to call Debbie and your, your nurse before it's so much you can't live your normal life. So there are as well some very rare and very serious um, uh, complications. So I mean, I could give you everything in the world that could happen. And so these are quite serious side effects, um, pancreatitis, um, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. I don't know if you know anybody that's had that before. It's where you can't climb the stairs because you're so weak and then you can't breathe. Um, myasthenia gra gravis, we already had a patient with that. This The skin lesions where you actually slough your skin off your body. Um, this, these HLH, which is a serious blood disorder. These are things that end up people in hospital. So we want you to, we want to find everything before it ends up in hospital. Early detection is key. And virtually every one of these side effects is manageable and reversible, but we want to catch it early. The only ones that are not reversible is thyroid. I don't think it's a huge deal. You do have to go on a thyroid pill for the rest of your life because kind of it go the thyroid turn gets all turned on. These they they get all turned on and then they come down again and then your thyroid kind of burns out and you need the supplements of the um you need to to supplement your thyroid. People can get diabetes and that diabetes can stay. And it's about one in 1500 diabetes people actually need insulin. So it's a possibility you could end up needing insulin. But the key to all of this is pay, is making sure everybody is aware, which I think this is such a great webinar for Melanoma Canada to do because everybody needs to be aware. Patients need to know 
the, the, what when to when to call their docs and when to call their nurses just so that they know can get assessed early. Uh, monitor continuously. It, it's usually I'll tell you worse than the first few months. So you know, getting through the first few months is the important part. They can be severe, life threatening if not identified early. It's super important, and and. The differential diagnosis is tough. That's up to your, your healthcare team to do because, you know, it can be a pneumonia. It can be new and that can be immunotoxicity. So that's cut. That's why, that's why God made experts, right. To try to figure that out. So some other questions people might ask is this, do these things affect your quality of life. And I think Debbie showed you the slide um, that for the most part, People, and I'm gonna just go back to that slide for a second. So this is Keytruda and nivolumab are the same. You can you can just replace that. So the side effects are the same. 7% 7 of people on PD-1 inhibitors, including simiflumab, those three would be on this one, would have like 7% chance of having a side effect. Ipilimumab, 20% chance, and the combination 40% chance of having side effects. So the, the drug you're on affects the likelihood of getting the side effects, but it doesn't affect the severity of it. So 90% of people will do great, won't have any side effects on single agent Nevo. On combination, there about 40% of people will have some side effects. Some of them don't reverse. Like I said, the endocrine ones, the ones, the thyroid, that kind of thing where you need to take a supplement, those might not get better. And 10% will have an influence on their lifestyle, but it's usually temporary. Usually you can recover to normal. We want to catch you before you end up in hospital. If you're so bad, you end up in hospital. We generally can improve you to the point where you get back out again and you can still have a normal life. When do you call? You call for grade one and you call for grade one and two toxicities. That's when you call. Call if you have a serious fever. Call if you've been vomiting for over an hour. Call if you're having diarrhea, like frequent bowel movements, okay, but you're starting to have diarrhea, we want to know sooner than later. Any blood in the stool, we want to know. Severe fatigue, we want to know. If you're not moving an arm or a leg, that's an emergency. The ones that run into problems are the ones that don't call. So you need to call. You need to be the person that steps up and takes care of yourself. It's really important. I'm going to say we are uh, so much better. These drugs started coming around about 20 years ago, and we're just learning what the side effects are, how to manage them. We have a whole bunch of new drugs for grade three and four toxicities that we weren't using before. And so we're getting, you can see most of the grade twos we treat just with prednisone steroids, which are prednisone. And now we have a whole cadre of new medications that we use for this grade three and four toxicities. We are getting good and we're, these drugs are overall much safer than they were in the past. So when do the side effects start? I think I showed you before, most of them start in the early on, and this is just another way to show the same thing. So you can see this is in the first four months. This is the timeline is months. Endocrine, which is usually thyroid in the first three months. Stomach often in the first month, rarely a little bit later. Liver, first one to two months. Lung, first two to three months, kidney, first two to three months, and rash in the first month or two. So most of them are going to start in the first two, up to four months you're on drug. Do they get better? Vast majority do, except the thyroid diabetes. Those are the ones that we have trouble getting better. And I've highlighted the this blue line because this is patients with melanoma on these treatments because we know we're using these drugs for everybody right now. Lung, Start, like we're using it for so many different drugs, uh, um, diseases now, but this is the melanoma and the percent is the percent of cases that are resolved. People got better. So half of the thyroid and diabetes will get better, but the other half will not. 90% of the stomach people with diarrhea, nausea, vomiting get better. 95% of people with liver problems get better. 95% of people with lung problems get better. Nine, over 90% of people with kidney problems get better. The rash can be a little more persistent, but it usually settles down to a mild rash and not one that, that will bother people's quality of life. Again, most people have no or mild side effects. Again, so if you're taking just one Nevo or, or Keytruda by itself, you have a 95% chance you're not gonna have any side effects. 
If you're taking combination therapy, you have a 40, 40 to 45% chance you're going to get side effects. That's you catch it early, treat it early, it'll get better. Can I tell who's going to have the side effects? No. So we give the same drug to 90 year olds that we give to, well, I don't often give combination therapy to older people because I don't think they're going to handle the side effects because that's a really important consideration. If I know you have a 45% chance of bad diarrhea, I'm not going to give it to someone that isn't likely to call, isn't likely to follow up with us, or is so old that diarrhea would actually make them very ill. So you have to be careful who you give the drugs to. So, but I can't tell who is going to get the side effects. Nobody can tell. We don't have that marker, but they're working on that. And I bet it's, I bet we will identify that in the next few years. If someone has a pre-existing autoimmune disease, that, that can be an issue. It can be managed but they might have a flare of their autoimmune disease. So if someone has rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis um, or um, lupus, those kind of things can get flared with these things because you already have, an, your immune system is already a little, uh, the brakes are off a little bit already. And now we're taking the brakes off more. And so that, that th those things can get a little worse. But we are in the process of trying to figure out how we can identify people that are going to be sick and who are not. How can you prepare? There's not a lot you can do um, except make sure you know our phone number and call us early. So a healthy diet, if you're having diarrhea, like just don't eat vegetables and fruit and all those things that are going to make your diarrhea worse. The brat diet, which is bread, rice, apple juice, and tea, like just eat that's so the brat diet's helpful for diarrhea. Use your modium and Lomotil, like take the drugs we give you. We recommend avoiding alcohol because it affects the liver and we might be doing that too. We don't want to stop your drug because you drank too much last night and now your liver functions are off. And spicy fluids, like Debbie said, can inflame the GI tract and make it harder on your gut. So try to try to tone down your spicy foods. I'm gonna move this. There is one connection that's interesting between the development. So do we think if you have a side effect, you're more likely to stay in control? There is some association between side effects and response. So there is some data that says that people that had melanoma so bad that they had to stop their, they had, sorry, they had the side effects of their immune therapy was so bad, they had to stop their treatments. They actually do as well as people that continued their treatment. And that probably means that they, we have, when we start, when the, the immune therapies to rev up your, your immune system, it doesn't automatically rev back down again. And it can stay just a little revved on the whole time just to keep your cancer controlled, which is a good thing. But then you have to, you know, monitor for side effects. There, um, some, and it's not like the, the literature is a little contradictory. Is it better? Is it not? But there's some evidence that says it's better. We do know this though, and this is important. Having side effects is not a guarantee of benefit. But not having side effects is not a guarantee of no benefits. So if you don't have like a vast majority of people will walk in, get their treatment, go home, nothing ever happens to them and say, is this working? Like, how do I know if it's even working? We do know that even if you have no side effects at all, you can get the same benefit of someone that's having a lot of side effects. There is one called vitiligo. So you probably remember Michael Jackson having vitiligo where you lose the melanin, which is the stuff that makes your skin brown. And it turns white in patches. And that's that's an autoimmune effect. And so if you think about it, that melanin, that, that stuff that turns your skin brown, is the same stuff that gives you melanoma. And so it makes sense that if you get vitiligo, then there's a benefit in the treatment of melanoma because you're fighting the cells that actually give you can't that gave you the melanoma. So in terms of int intimacy, um, there obviously more and more people are getting these checkpoint inhibitors and there's, there's not a lot of contra contraindication to fertility, to, to sexual activity. I'm going to talk about fertility separately for people that are hypothyroid and hyperpituitary. So they, the brain issues, you might feel too tired to have sex for a while, but if you take, take your treatments, we'll supplement your thyroid, we'll supplement your pituitary, and then you should have the energy to do it again. For pregnancy, we really don't know. So we recommend do not get pregnant on this therapy because we don't know its effect on sperm. We don't know its effect on ovaries. We recommend waiting at least six months until the very end of treatment. 
and do practice safe birth control on these drugs. If you're already pregnant, um, it's and this has not been tested, it's not like anybody could ever test this, but uh, we would never start someone like with stage two or stage three melanoma if we knew they were pregnant, we would never do that. If the patient's metastatic, one idea is to wait to the third trimester. Again, nobody's going to know for sure, and it's going to be a strong discussion with the family. In terms of vaccinations, um, so vaccinations, as long as they're kind of the normal COVID and flu vaccinations are okay on immunotherapy, so you don't have to worry about that. There are some live vaccines like... Um, there's a live shingles vaccine. You can have the dead shingles vaccine called Shingrix, but you can't have the live vaccine. Um, and there measles, mumps, rubella, most older people don't do that. Um, and it basically, uh, you know, we do recommend COVID and flu vaccines. There's not an interaction with the, how well the drug works and there should not be an increase in side effects. In terms of resources that you can go to, Ontario, we have the health cards that you can put in your car, in your wallet. So when you go to the emergency room, that you can show this to the emergency room doctor, it lists all of these pot potential problems that the do emergency room doc needs to know that they should call us with if they have those side effects. This is just an example of where we pulled all this information from. This is from Ontario Health Cancer Care Ontario, where they've looked at really all of the um all of the um, potential side effects, RSV is a dead vaccine. And then um, this is just another opportunity to look for help. This is the OncoAssist that Bristol's Microsquib uh, put together to help patients kind of navigate this whole system of melanoma and immune therapies, a whole bunch of other uh, opportunities for uh, looking up information. And that's the end of my talk.